Hello, everybody, and welcome to Writer's Block with Miriam. Now, I'm delighted to have a legend of Irish broadcasting on the show with me today. You'll remember him from your youth, if you're like me, from the Lyrics Board, Sunday Miscellany, you name it, Kevin Hawk has done it. And I'm so delighted to have him on board today to talk about his wonderful biography, which is called It's Wonderful, A Musical Life. Kevin, welcome to the show. Lovely to see you, Miriam, again. Lovely to see you too, my I gosh. Have. The last time I saw you, I think you came around after a concert in Drogheda because Carl McCabe was directing it. That's right. And you had worked in Von Rattie with Carl, is that right? That's right, yeah. Well, he was he was producing and directing the show in the Pogue Castle. Yes. Yeah. But he used to come to Von Rattie where I was yeah. and I was also in Dungura Castle as a performer yeah. there and he used to pop up there from time yeah. to time well, as well. To see you. Now, that's a long time ago, so there you go. Oh, there I, I know. Long, I tell you, look, the hair has gone grey. <laughs> Well, so look, we have to put up with it. My sister cut mine the other day for me because it was all really down, you know. My I hair know. goes very quickly. But and anyway, she did, well, not a bad if, if I might ask, which of the many sisters was that? Patricia. She lives nearby. Oh, Patricia, lovely. Patricia lives about 10 minutes away from me, so we sort of meet up at weekends. I go to her, she comes to me for lunch on very a Sunday. Good. We don't see each other other than that, really, unless there's something dreadful going on. She's a great handy woman. She can do everything. So if something is going wrong here, I ring her up, say, could you come over and fix this? That's what she's like. She's great. Oh, she's a fantastic <laughs> woman. Great person to have around. You're probably the same yourself. <laughs> Well, Kevin, we're going to be talking yeah. in the main about your wonderful book. As you can see, it's well thumbed and well read. Yes, I see <laughs> all your markings. <laughs> what a fantastic, uh, what a fantastic biography. You wrote it in conjunction with Alison Maxwell. Isn't that right? Yes. I'll tell you what happened now. I was writing that book back in 2004 when I moved down to France. I bought a place in France and I started writing and I retired from RTE in 2009. But anyway, this producer in RTE, Peter Mooney, was going to actually edit it for me. But sadly, he, he got very ill and he passed on. Oh, my gosh. And then I got my cancer immediately after he died. So the book sort of went on hold. And then I went to Veronica Dunn's launch of her book. And I saw the name Maxwell on, the, on her credits. And I said, would Alison ever uh, have a look at my book? And she said, I'll give her a ring. So Alison came on board and she was a marvellous help because she had to do an awful lot of work because I had to really go back to the start again, you know, start all over again. I know, I know. It's quite, I mean, it's a difficult job as well to find someone who's a good editor yeah, and shadow and, writer as well. Yeah, and you're, and you're digging out all the pictures and the old stuff and going back through all the old programs. You know, when we moved house from Raleigh years ago, I lost a lot of stuff that I had, you know. Oh, dear. Yeah, because when I first went into the Olympia, I was living in Beechwood Avenue in Raleigh. Then we moved to Dundrum and now I'm in Churchtown. But anyway, we got enough stuff, I think, to keep the reader happy. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You did. Yes. Absolutely. Nice and it's, it's a really wonderful book. And if I can just for a moment take you right back, your parents, they were a great influence on you, weren't they? Yeah, they were both musical, you see. You know, my mother was a singer and a pianist and daddy played the violin. So there was always music in the house. You know, when we were growing up, like uh, we'd have sessions at home, no television then, you know, Sunday night, we'd have other musical families over and everybody would get up and to their party piece. Yes. Great. I'd love to see that happening again. I'd yes. love to see families come together. But you see, we're glued to the box now. Yeah, and I know. I have to say, since I retired, I love television. I really I know. Do. I know. I, There's such a variety now, isn't there? Oh, we're spoiled for choice, you know, with Netflix and everything else. We've, we've just too much stuff. I record an awful lot of stuff I'll never get to see. <laughs> no. Well, I have a photograph up here of your father and your mother and her parents. So he was Michael, wasn't he? And she was Patricia. That's right. And then Ellen was my grandmother and John was her husband. He worked in Guinnesses and she was a nurse. 
Oh, really? My, yeah, sure. my grandfather was a long line of Coopers and Smellers and Guinnesses. So, okay, and of go. course, the, the, medical, the medical department in Guinnesses was the, the, one of the first. It was one of yeah. the great firsts for big companies to produce oh, yeah. a, they looked a, a, a medical. They looked after really well. Oh, they my. really looked after them. And his son went to work in Guinnesses as well, my Uncle Pat. So he'd be my mother's brother. Oh. And he, he went into Guinnesses as well, you know. Oh, I knew lots of people working there. They were, they were terrific employers. Oh, they were. They were. My, my grandmother was a, a Guinness widow, and it was something she was what? very proud of. Yes. And they had great dental, dental is a unit as well. But your mother was a wonderful singer and pianist. And, and you mentioned in the book how, you know, she'd regularly sit down in the house and she'd play for all of you. I mean, where do we get this these days? We, we don't see this. <laughs> See that. It might be happening and we don't know about it because, you know, if you look at the Feshkjol, there's a lot of very, very good musicians coming up in the Feshkjol. Yes. But whether they're doing what we did or not, I just don't know. But yes, Mama used to used to sing and then she'd say, come in, I have this piece about the Titanic. And I was sort of, I couldn't believe what I was listening to because it was a marvellous descriptive piece of what happened musically. You know, they had it written for yes. when the Titanic left Belfast and went to Cove and on to, uh, on out into the ocean before it comes to meet this dreadful iceberg. But the music for that was incredible because at one stage in the music, there's a, an afternoon tea party where the first class passengers, they're up all dancing and it all of a sudden moved to that light sort of two step type music, Foxtrot, you know? I and know! Then, the iceberg comes and the music goes way down the lowercase all and as a child you'd actually be terrified because you could actually visualize the iceberg you know the, the meeting the iceberg and the awful thing that happened and the very last piece in that now there's lots of pieces for different things you know even stoking the boilers there's a piece of music for that and the music at the very end is nearer my god to the which they say was played as it went down because the musicians stayed on board you know so so it had all these different movements yeah and i was actually what? frightened i have to tell you as a child because above each page in the music there was just to tell you what was happening there's a lot of a description of what this now is happening Yes. So you sort of knew when the iceberg was coming. I always hated that bit because I knew, oh God, this is where the ship is going down. And I don't know whether the piece of music is available or not, but I remember there was a ship going down on the front of it and huge letters, Titanic, you know. And, and is this something that you've continued to play yourself over the years? I have never actually played it because when we left house, that music, unfortunately, was mislaid. Oh, no. But I did go to see the musical. In, there was a musical in Broadway. I went to see Titanic, the musical, and I have the CD. I like that. It's terrific. But it's actually frightening. It really is frightening yes. to think that that actually happened. I know. It was, it was shocking. Hard, you know, I was a bit... Anyway, there was also other lovely little things like me and my teddy bear and all these things. We used to say we were kids. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it wonderful though that the gift like that that your parents can can leave you with? You know that would have been the catalyst. That was the thing. But like, whereas that was your mother. You mention in the book that your father's shop. You mention that you know it, working in that shop with him gave you great organisational skills. It did, and you see, in those days, you know everything had to be cashed up. And a lot of things have to be written in a book. A lot of people had accounts yes, in those days. They did. And they'd pay you by the month, some of them. Yes, yes. So everything was written down. And then when you'd go to count the money at the end of the day, it was in a little brown box. And that all had to be put out on the table. Everything counted. Farthings, halfpennies, pennies, shillings, half crowns, right up along. And then they'd all go into little bags for the bank the next morning. The bank was the Munster and Leinster Bank on Cromlin Road. And, they and, and the, shop the, was on, the shop was on Cromlin Road. It, it was across from the Ivy Gardens. Ah, yes. Yes. That's where we had our shop. And on that block, there was a butcher. There was fish and chipper, Shervies. We think they were Italians. They said they were anyway. <laughs> but they had Dublin accents. 
<laughs> there was a drapers, there was a chemist. We did everything on that block. Yes. And then up at the very top of the of that road was Our Lady's Hospital for sick children, you know? Oh, of course. Yes, so I spent some time in that myself. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the staff would call in, you know, to buy stuff on the way up when they were going on the night duty. Yes. You know, the night shift, they'd call in for sweets and cigarettes. And they, so, so opening time, I presume he would have been there from maybe six in the morning. And when did he close? Well, Daddy went to the market around seven or eight. We opened at nine o'clock on the dot and we closed at one o'clock for an hour. And then we closed at eight o'clock that night. It was a very long day. So he probably wasn't home until nine, half nine. We very seldom, very seldom saw him. Like the, his full day at home would be Christmas Day. Every other day he was in the shop. Yes. And that's the way it was in those days. Because yes. when you're a small business and you have a big family, well, you have to work. Seven days a week. Yeah. And I mean, even when I went to Radio Aaron, I used to go up occasionally to help at the weekends. If I, you know, if I was off, I'd go up and help out. Because I felt eight of us, you know, a lot to feed from small, it's a small business. Eight of you. Yes. I mean, really, weren't they fantastic? Weren't they yeah, just wonderful? Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you'll right. get all the names right. So from well, left is it's Maura. Maura, Ursula, Patricia, Kevin, Fanula, oh. Phil, Maeve, and Michael is the youngest, little blondie. Oh my goodness. And sweet. the youngest of the family now is 67 this year. He's really? the youngest. <laughs> That's the youngest. Oh my yeah. gosh. My and gosh. I'm I'm and, 77. And the, I'm in the middle. Really? Yes, of course. That, a middle child. It yeah. must have brought with it a lot of um, interesting... <laughs> well, they said I was spoiled, but I really wasn't, you know. I, to, I had to pull my weight, you know. And I always had to go up to the shop when I was free to help out. And I did it, but I enjoyed it. I liked, I liked meeting the customers. They all had stories to tell. And a lot of them had sad stories. I remember we had an assistant in the shop one time. Her name was Olive, and this one nearly always came to her with sad stories, you know. I and Olive got a bit fed up. I'm sick listening to hard luck stories, she'd say to me. But it was great fun. It's great fun. really great fun. The Dublin humour, you know yourself. Oh, <laughs> honestly. And, and you, the, the things that stick in your mind, you know. Wait, did you ever have a, um, was the shop ever held up? Or did you ever have any difficulties like that? We had, yes, we had... They didn't, they didn't come in and hold us up, but they did rob at night because upstairs uh, we had an apartment where we used to live before we moved. And when that was vacant, they did break in a few times. It was terrible, really. Daddy would come in in the morning and cigarettes mainly was what they wanted. Yes. But it's cigarettes. the damage, you know, searching for the cigarettes. They'd, they'd knock things off shelves. And we, a few times, you know, Obviously, the insurance people got fed up paying out insurance. And it was just awful. I felt so sorry for Dad, but that's the way it was. And we tried to, like, you try your best. You put up all sorts of barricades, all sorts of bolts and chains and everything, but they got in. I know, I know. I, 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 we had, in our family, we had pub and news agents and things like that. I, I remember my parents had a news agent on Anima Road that we all worked in, and it was just as the drug scene was hitting, and it yeah. did force us to sell. So your parents were wonderful that they hung in there for as long as they did. How many yeah. years did they have that business? Well, they were there, Miriam, until such time as the supermarkets yes. started to open locally. You know, yes. But Daddy would have retired. I think Dad was about. He must have been nearly seventy when he retired died and he would have been there since when did they buy 1935 i think it was i think they bought in 1935 so they're a long time but uh, he couldn't he couldn't I mean, see we were all working there that's it so there was no need for the shop anymore and also we had moved to around a long long time ago and we couldn't wait for him to retire we wanted them to give up, you know, because we were all working and it wasn't as yes. easy to yeah. help out, you know. And, and, and so many of you, at that point, you went into music that, that you had singers in the family, pianists. Philomena was a violinist, wasn't yes, that right? Fanula right. was a soprano. 
Yes, that's right. I'm um, doing very, very well. I think, yes. is it only Michael who actually didn't go into music? Or... Michael was the drummer. No, he did. He oh, he was a drummer. Oh. All over the... Michael oh. was trained so by all Bob of you. Louis. Yeah. Michael played drums and then he got a fall. Uh, he was up on a ladder and he injured his wrist. And I tried to set in. He couldn't play anymore. But Little Michael used to go around with Albert Healy down to the Nina Musical Society and lots of societies. And he used to play the drums. Yeah. So, so all the family are musical and you're yeah. all very talented. And yeah. you know, it, it, it just strikes me that that must have been a huge support group in its own right for people. We talk about not having support today, but that must yeah. have been just wonderful. It was great, Miriam. And I mean, you know, as all, most of us, nearly all of us went down to uh, the College of Music. Yes, the College of Music, yes. Yeah. And Arthur went into the What's concert orchestra. She was the fiddle player. Maura played cello. When she got married, she started up the Musical Society in Latham. St. Mary's Musical Very Society. Very close to me here. Is that right? Well, she I'm loved... I'm in Drogheda. Her. My goodness. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm broadcasting to you live from Drogheda, right beside the Boyne River. <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it up there. And I really enjoyed our night up there. It was the John McCormack. Yes, in, in, yes, in Linda Kenny. Yeah, and it was really lovely. Yeah, Wonderful. Yeah. Now, I have a photograph of you oh, up there in 1971. <laughs> Look at you, weren't you so cute? That was for my first audition in RTE when I moved out to Donnybrook from Henry Street. They were looking for people to sing for programmes and yes. I, I sort of applied for it and then now, why had I that on? I didn't wear that to the audition. I'm trying to well, think. Yeah. I, it might have been, it have because been at, this, at this stage, I think also, weren't you starting to do shows? You were starting to, 1971 was a year when you did Land of Smiles. France. That's right, and the gaiety. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but now I had just come back. Actually, that was the American, one of our American outfits. We went in 1969 with Frank Patterson to America. And now that's coming back to me. That was that for the, was the promo section. shot. And then we had for the Scottish section, we had red jackets. And that was for the Irish section. And that was one incredible tour, wasn't it? It was Canada as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, that was like very, very hard work, but very enjoyable. We, we sang six nights a week and we traveled from the East Coast to the West Coast. Most Americans I've spoken to, they've never been to all the places. I've been to in America. In America? Oh, no, we never there. Oh, no, we never there. Oh, no, we never went there. It was now We went to Hollywood, Los Angeles. We started, of course, New York, up to Rochester. We went to Oklahoma, Boston, Chicago, all over. And then in Canada, we did Niagara. We did Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Toronto, uh, Ottawa, Vancouver. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Now, and at a time yes. like that, to have such an amazing tour... And I who organised that? Who, what, what, can you remember what, who that was yes, for? Yes, Ilio Reedy, uh, sorry, Ilio O'Grady. Ilio oh, yes. O'Grady, who's now passed on. She was married to Frank Patterson. Yes. And she organised it all. And the promoter, now let me think what his name was. He was an Italian man. And he, we never, did we get to see him? I think we got to see him once. He was the big promoter in America. He brought us over. Yes. yes, his name was Alberto Marini. And I think I saw him once because he had a tour manager called Harry Rand. And Harry just took over everything. All the rehearsals. He had somebody to do the lighting, somebody to sell the programs. You know, it was a big organization. We all traveled on a bus. Oh and my we, goodness. Had a few, we had a few internal flights. If we had to be, say, we had to be in Salt Lake City at one stage, I remember. That had to be a flight from yes. where we had been the night before, because it was too far to travel, you know. But it was a fabulous tour. I really learned an and, awful and lot. And would you, when you went there, you, as, I, as you just said there, you learned an awful lot. Would you have thought ever of perhaps migrating? No. 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 I never thought. I, I mean, my first week uh, in New York was sort of a shock, because I hadn't been out of the country before. And I tell you... Uh, it was all the different nationalities. And what really, really bothered me was to see all the black people doing the awful jobs. Yes. And yes. that bothered me an awful lot. Yeah. I felt 
I all of a sudden felt so sorry for these people that yes. this is where they end up, you know? Yes. And I went to Africa after that tour. Yes. Your right. sister, Maeve, didn't she uh, prompt you to go on the first occasion? Wasn't that right? Well, I'll tell you what happened the first time. I went the first time to Mombasa, to Kenya. I had a friend working over there. And I went over and his brother worked for British Airways at the time. And he flew from London and I flew from Dublin. And I was there for about three weeks. And uh, sadly, that man who taught me in school died only about four weeks ago from Alzheimer's. But he was oh. good in his 90s. But however, though, then I went. Maeve was then living in the Gambia. Her husband was working for the ILO. So she rang up with it. Why don't you move for a few weeks? So I went over to West Africa. Wow. And East Africa was nicer, I think, because the beaches and, you know, Mombasa is a beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, and I was absolutely. there at the daytime too, because in 1969, they got their independence, you know. Yes. And uh, Yomo Kenyatta, they were all going along the streets, hailing him. And it was changed then from Kenya to Kenya. Yes. Yes. And it was when I was there that all happened. So the excitement was amazing. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I had no idea that you were as well traveled as you were. You know, yeah. it, it, it's, it's fantastic, nothing. really, yeah. that the amount of, um, uh, of experience yeah. you were gaining. What age were you when you were in um, Kenya? I was 25. 25. Yeah. Then when I came back, I went into, I think I went into, let me think now. Was, oh yes, it was the last Neverland Smiles. And from there then into the Olympia. Oh, that's me before I went up on the helicopter. Yes, <laughs> I'll come to that in a moment. This oh, one here now. Um, that's Smiles, Katie. That's right. Now, and my one of my relations, Val Fitzpatrick, was the man who spotted you and told Jack Cruz about you. Were well, you related to Val? I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, Val, the Fitzpatricks are on my mother's side. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yes, Val, no Val used to write shows for me. When I performed in Spain, he used to write one-woman shows for me. Ah, uh, isn't that marvelous? Yeah, isn't that amazing? I miss him. And he used to perform right be uh, only about 15 minutes in the car from where I live now. You have Mosley. And Mos he was the resident comic for That's years. Right. He Mosley. went down to Mosley, too, with, with Jack Cruz. I remember he was there. Yeah. And his wife Rose used Rose. to do the costumes. That's <laughs> right. That's right. But that show, Val came to see that show. And when Jack was casting Cinderella, yes, that was around November, this show. And he, was, he couldn't find the buttons. And Val said to him, Your buttons is around in the gaiety. Go up and have a look at them. And I got a call then from Jack, would I come in? Which and that show ran for 13 weeks. That's it. That, um, that is, and, and, and in this you were playing Rudy, isn't that right? This one I played Rudy, which is a comedy part, song and dance sort of man, you know. And they're all, a lot of those girls there were in the Lindsay Singers, Ethna Barra. Do you remember Ethna Barra? Do you remember the Lindsay? I do, Ethna Barra. Now, they're, they're all from the Lindsay's. They were a lovely company, the Glass Nevin Musical Society. And I did a few other things with them. I directed them in the Gaiety one time. They're a lovely company. But they're all, it's all finished now, of course. Yes. Nothing happening, I'm afraid, for an artist, as you know. So yes. it's sad times. Now you're going to the Lebanon, I see. And, and yes, again, off on your travels, this time yeah. with RTE. Yes, Maxie came with me on Trassa Davis. Maxie from Maxie Dick and Twink, for those That's of you right. who remember Maxie Big Dick and Twink. Of mine. We're still in touch all the time. Now, yes, that picture now was taken. We went over to interview the Irish troops for yes. our program. And uh, this was, it was Christmas time, wasn't it? It was a Christmas. Yes, it was. Broadcast. It was for Christmas. It was for a Christmas program. I can't remember, did we go in November? Anyway, we went over and uh, they had a piano in a place called Tibneen, which was like uh, down a hill from where we were staying. And they said, Kevin, if we bring up the piano, would you play a few tunes, you see? And maybe Maxie would sing. Yes. So we were all recording all day long. We did all our work during the day. And then at night, Maxie got into her guna, as she says. And <laughs> her guna, her dress. For those watching who don't know what a guna is, it's a dress in Irish. 
<laughs> and didn't she bring, didn't they bring up the piano? And you know, moving a piano, you know what it's like? It's out of tune when it arrives. Exactly. Wherever it's going, it has to be tuned. <laughs> this piano came up. <laughs> oh my course, gosh. It's really hard work, but we enjoyed it so much. And, and, and how lo- this was like, ni- you know, this was 1986. Yes. And, and so you were out there for how long exactly? We were a week in the Lebanon. We flew to Tel Aviv and uh, the week before we went from Dublin, there had been a terrible thing in London whereby this girlfriend, she was an Irish girl and she was being put on a plane by her boyfriend and she was going with her child and he had planted a bomb in her case. And luckily, when the case was going through, the security man stopped and said, there's something here. And they discovered a bomb. And she was going to be on that plane with his child. And the thing would have exploded. Yes. Luckily, it didn't happen. But of course, my father said, you're not going out. That's a very dangerous place you're going to. (laughs) But it was so funny because we were going through that. I had to open my, my, uh, it's called a Euro tape machine, a very old machine. And I had to take out the batteries and I had to show them the record button. They were terrified. I had something that was going to blow up. Of so I course. showed them the microphone. I showed them how everything worked. And I had to wrap all my tapes in tinfoil because if they went through with material on them without tinfoil, everything would be wiped. Oh! So tinfoil around all the tapes. It was much, much easier now to do programs than it yes. was then. Yes. And the old machine was very heavy. But we managed fine. It was grand. And you mention in the book a, a, a situation where you, uh, one particular evening, you, you just popped out to have a, just a, some air, a little mosey around the back. Uh, uh, and then suddenly, I don't know whether you smoked at the time, but, you know, suddenly you were tapped on the shoulder by one of the personnel and said, you've got yeah. to get back in quick because yes, snipers are out here. Because there had been bombs. When we arrived, we heard explosions. And the guy who was actually our driver, uh, he said to us, he said, they, they're just welcoming you. They want, they want, you, to, <laughs> they want you to know <laughs> that they're here. And anyway, they, they said, that's just a welcome for you, all those. But we 21 gun salute. And we know we had, like, we had those bulletproof vests. Yes. And we had, as you can see, we had those helmets on. We felt very safe, really. Yes. When we went out, you know, we went to lots of places where the soldiers were positioned. And we do a few interviews there, and then we go on to the next place. And, and they were and, all just sending messages to their families at home. Yes, yes. And, and did you do the edit for that on the spot over there, yes. or did you do no. it at No, I brought it home to Dublin, and I did all the editing there. We had far too much material, so we had to contact some of the people just to explain. <clears throat> that way you sort of ran over time. You know, you didn't want to be saying no to people when they wanted to. Oh, of course, absolutely. Maxie actually filled in. The ones that we couldn't do, she certainly mentioned them on the radio and they all heard their names, you know. And they were great singers, some of them, because when Maxie was finished singing, I'd say, look, there must be somebody here who can sing. And then they'd all say, oh, yeah, Jimmy over there can do, you know, such a thing. And one fella came up, he's Minnie the Moocher, I remember that well. And Gay Byrne put that out on his radio show when I came home. Oh, very good. And he said, I always know Kevin Hawke's playing because at the very end, he always does dun, 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 to make yes. sure that we know he's finished. <laughs> well, you know, you give some very interesting tidbits of information as well. I mean, you, you, you also make the point, which, you know, younger people probably won't realize is that up to 1966, the national broadcasting station was called Radio Aaron. That's right. And we only came to use RTE later on. And you yes. also talk about it being based in Henry Street and yes. at the GPO. My and- first job was in Henry Street on the top floor of the GPO. And we used to go up in a lift right up to the top. And we had about 10 studios there. And everything was a bit old and antiquated, you know, before we moved out to Donnybrook. But I worked a lot with the Radio Aaron Clares. They were a group of Yes! Actors. And when I went into Radio Aaron, there were 28 full-time actors. They were all permanent and pensionable. 
That's and right. An awful lot from watching those actors because radio acting is probably the most difficult of all because you really yes. have to get that character into somebody's living room. And in those days, there were very few televisions around and people listened every Sunday night to the radio air and play. Yeah, and they had to rehearse all week, didn't they? Yes, we used to rehearse all week. Yes, we did. But sometimes we put out two serials as well. We, we did a play in Irish every week. So you and have to do an interview on scale go when you went there. So when you started uh, officially, when you started in RTE, you had applied for the position of, of a sound effects person. Right. Wasn't that right? It was one That's of your right. relatives spotted in the newspaper, you said in the book. That's right. My uncle, the Paddy. Your uncle yes. Willie, was it? Uncle Paddy. Your uncle Paddy. Paddy McNulty. And he had written plays for radio. He was a teacher, but he used to write Irish plays oh. for children. Oh. And they were broadcast, you see. Such a talented said, job would really suit you. He said, that job would really suit you, Kath. So I applied. And in those days, they trained you first yes. before the interview. Because they wanted to see, well, now, could he actually do this job? Yes. So I went in and I did six weeks training. I was still working in Brooks Thomas at the time. And I did the training at night. And then I did my interview with about three or four people. And then I got a letter to say, you've got the job. <laughs> I was delighted. Oh, then one yes. I said, he plays the piano, you know, and an awful lot of p dramas have music, but they couldn't always match it up to the recorded music on the record because you'd have to stop when the actor was stopping, you know. So they'd bring me in and I'd tinkle away and then I'd have a script in front of me. And then I'd know when they're coming up to the end and I'd know to finish right up. As soon as they finished, I'd be finishing. Very, very good. You couldn't buy that experience, you know? No, no, you couldn't. Loved it. And you told a lovely story about um, the canteen in the GPO. Oh, <laughs> God, the mice. <laughs> the mice. <laughs> Somebody wrote to me recently <laughs> and said, uh, I remember you in Radio Air. I said, he said, I worked for the post office. And he said, I'm doing a piece in Ireland's own, and can I mention some things from your book? And I said, yes, you can. So he said, will you ever forget the mice? And I said, well, I only saw them because I was in so early in the morning, because once the staff comes in, they'd all be run, well, they'd all run off. But you'd see them on the pans, on the cookers and everything. It was terrible. I mean, I'd never have a meal there. We just went up to use the toaster. Yes. Because we were on the breakfast show at seven o'clock, you see, and about eight o'clock, everybody would really be before the program was out, all be hungry, and they'd say, Kevin, will you go up and get the tea and the toast? And you'd open the door quietly, and next month there'd be a scutter. <laughs> my <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Now, I'm sure it's not like that now. Oh, you know? I'm pretty sure, yes. I can remember I'm having, I went to see the exhibition, the 1916 exhibition in the GPO, and I went oh, to, yes. to their restaurant area, and it's beautiful there. <laughs> so, Is it? I haven't been really there. It's really lovely. Sure. Now, yeah. I tell you, you mentioned the Radio Erin players there, and I, I remember Brendan Caldwell. Yes. And Brendan, when I, Brendan used to live beside me in Fairview. Did he? And yeah. when I was about two and a half and I'd be sitting in the garden, it was my parents' first married home, I'd be making my daisy chains in the garden, yeah. you know. And yeah. this man used to lean over the gate when he was coming back from RT every day and he'd chat and he'd come in and he'd make daisy chains with me. And it was Brendan Caldwell. <laughs> My goodness, was it? He was great. And you had, well, you had uh, Peg Monaghan. Peg Monaghan. Now, I don't know whether Eamon you Kelly. remember. Do you remember the Foley family on radio? I think you're too young. I was, can't uh, remember. No. It was George Green and uh, Peg Monaghan. They were two Dublin ones, you know. Yes. And it was very popular. It was written by David Hayes, a guy who wrote oh, yes. a musical for the Olympia after that but anyway this this was a very popular series on radio and and they were the main characters but then we we also had Daphne Caro who was married to Dennis Brennan yes and she was the mother of course of Barbara Brennan and Catherine yes. Brennan and Jane Brennan and Stephen Brennan they yes. were all into the theatre in a big way and then we had Aidan Grinnell and we had Seamus Forge oh there was lots of we had Jeanette Waddell Jeanette Waddell was the one who came in one day after her cat had been attacked on Marion Square. She was terribly upset. And she came in and she was sort of crying. I said, Jeff, are you all right? And she said, my cat was attacked by a tomcat on Marion Square. 
And I started to laugh. I mean, it was terrible, but and she was crying. Oh. We had another very strange lady in the radio and players, and her name was Florence Lynch. And she used to exercise her dog by tying it to the back of her car because she wasn't, she got very old. She was a smoker. She couldn't walk. So she used to tie the dog to the back of the car and she used to drive slowly through Phoenix Park. <laughs> and I had a terrible vision of what if her foot slipped. I know. And, and, and accelerated. Would, the car would, the dog would end up beside her in the front seat. <laughs> It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? It does. But you know, the Radio Erin players, didn't they pick up a number of awards? They got, they got Jacob's Awards for different things. I had left that. I only stayed a few years there and I moved into sound engineering. Yes. And I... You were a senior did, sound were, engineer were, very soon. They were great actors. They did get awards. And you see, some of them then, they'd let them out to go into the theatre. You know, if, if there was they'd a play the academy, that somebody threw, they'd let them in and they'd have to get permission from the Radio Warren Authority to go in to a play. A lot of them were saying they found it difficult. They were used to reading scripts all the time. Then all of a sudden, they're in the theatre, they have to learn. And it was so long since some of them worked on the stage that yes. they were finding it very difficult, you know. Yes. And yet they loved to get out and do something different. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah, now, at this thing. stage, as, as your career is now starting to progress, you've, you've been sound effects, you've gone to senior sound engineer now uh, at this point, you're still running your, your stage career alongside this. You're, you're involved yes. with the musical theatre, um, the musical yes, societies. They, they let me out to do, they, they released me to do lots of stuff, but provided I did the early shift, the seven o'clock shift in RTE. But you see, the reason I think they let me out too was because they probably felt he's going to learn an awful lot more in the yes. theatre and he'll bring it back to us. Yes. Anyway, they very kindly let me go to America as well. They were very good to me in RTE, I have to say. Yes. But then when I went into sound engineering, I had to do a lot of night work. So that put a stop to all my theatre yeah. work for about three years. But then you had 1981, you got the offer of, well, I mean, you, you would have done lots of roles up to this, but this, I think this was a particularly wonderful role, Fagan in Oliver. Oh, yes, in Oliver. I'm reviewing the situation. I remember as well. Exactly. Yes. That, um, but you were a young you man. You were a young man playing older. That's right. And that makeup was designed by Evelyn Nunny in the makeup department in RTE. Because I said to her, look, I'm going down to Thurlis to play Fagan. Could you just give me a few hints? And she said, look, I'll show you how to do it. So I went over to makeup one day and we did it. And I wrote everything down. And then that was the result. <laughs> that was the result. And it's fantastic. That looks very heavy, but with the lights on, you know, that a lot of heavy lights, you wouldn't see like all of the lights. Anyway, yeah, Carl took that photograph. Oh, Cahill McCabe. Yes, he directed that one. He directed it, did he? He did, yes. Very, yes. very good. My he gosh. He work in Thurlis. I think he directed my Fair Lady film there as well. So this was the Thurlis um, Musical Society. Society. Yeah, they're very good. I think they're still running. Well, they're not now in the pandemic, but they were running up to such time as COVID arrived. Yes, I mean, the Glass Neville Musical Society is another one that you were very much associated with. I mean, you, how many yeah, societies yeah. do you reckon that you were working with as a, well, as a guest actor? And I worked with Muckross, I worked with uh, the R&R. &R. Yes. Mellon, I directed in Galway, Cork, uh, Tullamore. I worked for the Tullamore Musical Society. I remember as, as a young woman, I remember uh, going to audition for Kiss Me Kate. It was the r, &R oh, and you were one of the, you were one of the, I didn't get the part. But oh, I'm you so were sorry. The, I wasn't judging. <laughs> no, I tell you, I could, I, where I fell down in my young years was that I wasn't a dancer. And for a role like that, you needed your dancing yes. skills as well, yes. you know, as the, as the acting. Goodness, I'd forgotten I was on the panel for that. Yes, yeah. to come in occasionally to sit on the panel, you know. 
But the Or and Or is one incredible um, musical society, isn't it? I mean, the they're running over a hundred years. They're marvelous. Yes. They? Yeah, but at the moment they're stuck as well. There's nothing happening, and they're worried about, you know, how are they going to get back to the stage where they were at before COVID came? It's very difficult for them. It is to know very what difficult. To with you see, because a lot of people in the Or and R, you see, it's not a company anymore, and that they're all doing other things. They're all yes. going looking for parts around the country and a lot of people are going to England, you know. Uh, exactly, England, yeah. And, and, and to get the gaiety. That's why we went in. We loved being in the gaiety. Great yes. attraction for a young person starting off, you know. But now they they go to the concert hall. Well they did. And I directed their Mercado actually in the concert hall. But it's not the same as the theatre. No. It's not. You know, it's not at all. And, you know, again, just moving mm. back to your, your career, That's both on great. stage <laughs> and on television. Oh, my gosh. Will you ever forget Brendan Grace? Never. We were two nuns there, as you can see. The Brendan and Grace we, show, 1983. Yeah. And to promote that show, it was a very hot summer. And we were in the gaiety. And we went around on a Kawasaki motorcycle, dressed as two nuns. To promote, to promote the show. <laughs> Can you think of anything funny? And we'd stop at the traffic lights and there'd be a bus. Everyone suddenly turn around and look, oh my God, it's two nuns. Two nuns on a motorbike. <laughs> and I'd be quite boots, would you believe, under that outfit <laughs> to make it funnier. <laughs> a nun with big boots. <laughs> he was Mr. Kawasaki. No, I was Sister Kyle Saki, and he was Sister Harry O'Mara. And we were on the Late Late promoting it as well, and a priest objected. Oh, no. Uh, in Clonmel, yeah. Because uh, I got Tip a cutting. Temporary again. Yeah, I got a cutting from a friend down there, and they sent me the cutting from the local paper. And at the time, I was producing a children's program called Paparama, and the priest said, it's an absolute disgrace to see the producer of a children's programme in RTE coming out on the stage dressed as a nun. <laughs> and oh I showed it to Gay gosh. Byrne because he also mentioned we've been on the late, late, you know. But, you know. Oh, my goodness that. gracious me. Benton was wonderful to work with. I did a lot of shows with him. A lot of pantos and that. He was great fun, Brendan, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I met him in New fun. York. I remember um, meeting him in New York and he oh, was just, oh my goodness, the funniest man. He brought the house down every single time, you know, and I just, I just loved him. I thought that he was a wonderful character and he, he always, he was very unassuming. And, yeah, you know, he's he, great. Oh, he was fantastic. He was just fantastic. Yeah. And I don't think he has been replaced by anybody. I think he had a special talent. I, because he was a beautiful singer. Beautiful and, voice. Oh, beautiful voice. And, and another irreplaceable person, Gay oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Here he is, my old friend. We did a lot together. I did his musicals, Oklahoma, Pirates of Penzance. We did lots of concerts. And then we finished up by doing this late, late together with your cousin, my friend Joan Britton. Joan, yeah, Joan. Late, late show. We are, you see, the audience were all people from musical societies. Yes. They were all singers. And, then, and all our soloists in that show, they were all from the amateur musical society. Yeah. Uh, and, and you always gave them such great breaks. I mean, it was just incredible to, you've always been, you've always had a huge heart, Kevin. And, and it's something that well, Joan talks about often. Yeah, um, well, I always felt, you know, I got the break and I was lucky and I'd like to see other people getting a chance as well because the talent is out there. You know, I could see it in the musicals presented absolutely. by all these amateurs, you know. Absolutely. Excuse me. Yeah. I just, I, there's, a, there's yeah. a shot of you there as Buttons with That's Jack Button. Cruz. And Jack, poor Jack Cruz. Wasn't Lord he amazing? Martin, toured with Jack as well. And he was very popular in the opera house in Cork. But you know, it's funny, in Cork, they have a lot of 
very good choral societies, a variety of groups. And they have their own variety show. So we used to go down in the summer with Holiday Hayride and they didn't like it very much. They'd say, oh, oh we've got our own variety down here. <laughs> yeah, so you see what happens when you have an official opera house on yeah, your doorstep. You this, yeah, this that's like, we this. need one. We need one here. And <laughs> We certainly do. Look, that's the genie. And there you are with the Royalettes. Yes, Pat Conway and Paddy Dowling. In Aladdin, playing the genie. That's right. Tie a little knot in your pigtail. That number was sung in the London Palladium by Norman Wisdom. Oh! And I came across the music in Maze on the Green when I was doing that show. And Jack said, what are you going to sing here, Kev? And I said, hold on, I'll get something. And he sang that in London. And I said, look, will we do this? So I gave it to Alice Delgado and she did the choreography. We did all this sort of stuff. And the girls, I had a big long pigtail. And the song was called Tie a Little Knot in Your Pigtail. Then You Won't Forget. Oh, Stupid old wow. song. An old music hall song, you know. An old music hall song, but wonderful. Oh, I loved it. I loved that. That was a great part. I was popping out of, out of smoke all night. <laughs> I was arriving everywhere. Just, oh, my beloved Twink. Just having a look at Twink there. Now, Twink and her many talents, she's a, 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 able to cook and bake and what have you. She actually made your cake for your retirement. She did. I haven't seen it since. It disappeared. <laughs> but I don't mind. I got three other cakes. She brought out this cake, which was quite amazing. And it had, as you can see, the radio. Yes. And it had my tap shoes. That's it. And I can't remember what else it had. I'd love to see it again. I'm sure it's gone now, but... Uh, she took it away with her afterwards. Oh my goodness! But what? she's a great friend. Well, it's touch, you know, occasionally she rings me up. But uh, she's a very talented lady, really. When you think of it, isn't she? I mean, she's done. Lots oh, she of is absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But when, when let's just go back to Paparama for a moment because that was a very significant show, wasn't it? Um, was I it. mean, again, Cahal McCabe was the RT controller at the time, wasn't he? Uh, when Paparama started, it was Billy Wall. Okay. And then Carl McCabe. But that song contest ran for 25 years. My I goodness. finished my 25th song contest the year before I retired. I retired in 2009, and the last song contest was 2008. Oh, my goodness. And nobody else took it over. That was just the end. But 25 oh. years is a great one to go out on. Yes, it you is. Know, Absolutely, it is. It was one to work on. And, and uh, your, your work it. with Lyric Sport as well. That was good fun, yes. That Lyric. was five seasons, I think we did. And uh, um, Andy, Andy Rowan came up with that idea with Philip Kempf. And Andy came to see me playing the piano one night in Shannon's restaurant. He said, I have this idea for a television program for yourself and John Kyogg, would you be interested? And I said, well, let's talk about it and see what it work, you know? Yes. So we did a pilot and uh, we had great fun doing that. We had Helen Jordan, Kathy Nugent, I think, I can't remember who else sang. But anyway, we did the pilot out in the studio out in Sandyford somewhere. And then they presented that to RT. And they said, oh yeah, we think this will work. So, um, Lo and behold, the lyric sport happened. Lyric and sport happened for five seasons. Yeah, yeah, it, it did indeed. And and then you had also Sunday Miscellany. Sunday Miscellany, I loved working on. Yes, and uh, I liked it because I loved matching up the music with the actual themes of the pieces. The writers, you know, there are so many good writers out there when you think of it, and uh, I I loved doing that program. I think I did that for about a year and then I moved on to, they wanted me to do a program called This Is Your Half Hour Call. Yes. Which took me back into presenting myself. So that program then, Sunday Miscellany, passed on to another producer. Yes. You had such a, because you grew up with this, with music in the house the whole time, you had this background that must have been gold dust for RTE oh, yeah. to draw upon, you know, absolutely. Oh, yeah, they were delighted. Yeah, they were, they were always very good to me, though. I mean, they used me on programs that 
I, I, you know, I was very happy with all the programs I did for them. You know, I really did enjoy them. And I enjoyed but, the people although I Although you had with. quite a classical background, I mean, you, you would also present from the National Concert Hall, and usually they were live presentations from the yeah, National Concert Hall. I did Concert a lot of those, yes, I did. They were lovely. I did some of the orchestra. I sang with the orchestra a few times years ago. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, Concert Hall is very special to me. I love it. When really. you were younger, were you were were you as much influenced by cinema? Yes, I certainly was. We had a great little cinema in Ranelagh called the Sanford Cinema. Oh, great! And if I was a good boy and finished my homework in time, my mother would come back from the shop, and we'd go down to see a movie in the Sanford Cinema. Oh, and very I remember good! Seeing Casablanca there. And an awful lot of the old movies of Betty Davis. And yes. Those, all those. And of course, then we went on Saturday afternoon to see Roy Rogers and Hop Along Cassidy. And all the, you know, they used to have the Folly Ruppers, Flash Gordon and Tiger Woman, all those. And that was great. Because as kids, we used to go down and queue up. It was, I think it was six months to get in. And, and there, was we the, getting... there was the Royal Cinema as well, beside the Theatre Royal, wasn't there? Yes, there was the, the Theatre Royal and the Regal Rooms. And the Regal Rooms, yes. And the Regal Rooms, they had, uh, I remember one time, Alice Delgano, who was choreographer for the Royalettes, she might go in to see a film in the Regal Rooms and she'd get an idea for a number for the Royalettes oh. to do. For instance, they were showing Exodus in the Regal Rooms. She went to see it. And she, the next week, she had all the Jimmy Campbell singers and the Royalettes all doing a scene from Exodus. Oh! And they, Lovely, this land is mine. Oh, da, yes. Da, 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 this dee. land da, 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 is da, da, mine. Yeah. God gave anyway, this land I, I to me. I'm retired. My voice the moment I can't see it. But she next week had that all sorted out for the Royal. You know, they changed the show every Wonderful. week. Wonderful. I don't know how they did it. Every, imagine changing the show every week was amazing to me. I but you you that. were able to ring the changes, though, in your life. I mean, uh, you know, at this stage now, in this photograph, you're doing Eye in the Sky. You're hanging out of a helicopter. <laughs> That's right. That was for the Ian Dancy breakfast show. And the guy who does that, he was going away for a week. Bob Conway was his name. And they said, Kevin, would you do it? And I went up. It was one day, though it was very foggy, and we actually couldn't see anything. But most days, and some days, you might have to make it up, actually, because... <laughs> You'd have to make the weather up. <laughs> and make... People would make sort of be here and say, well, the traffic's not all that bad on Ellis Key. Kevin is saying it's very heavy. <laughs> to get your keys right, and you see your, your microphone, your headphones, your talk back... And you're sort of trying to do everything at once. It's not that easy. And trying to see everything from an overhead position and identify. Yeah, it was right. a whole different view of the city. It was. It was great. I loved it. I only did it for a year. But Bob was really good because he was so used to it. But, I mean, I the first one, I'll never forget. <gasps> <laughs> oh, so my gosh. Enough. Ah, well. I'm sure you, yeah. were fit. I'm sure you, you had to stay fit for that. You need to be well, fairly what fit. Happened, what happened was, it was out in Baldonnell Aerodrome, I think. Yes, it was. And they used to send a taxi in the morning at half past five. And then the guy would arrive with the helicopter. And I think we were on at about quarter to seven. Yes. We were on again at quarter past seven and quarter to eight. But yeah, it's well, fit. I wasn't really very fit, I think, but I... <laughs> I do anything. Yeah, really. you do. <laughs> when you went and, and obviously, level. I mean that that side to you is 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 well. What, what was the saying? Um, it's not a hit. What what's the famous saying that they were they used to come up with? Oh, you can't have a hit without a hawk. Yeah, you, you can't have a hit without a hawk. I mean, they were making fun of me now. <laughs> <laughs> but you you had this ability to just you know to say yes to things and to do things, and it struck me, you know, um. I suppose that continued even after you retired because you, you'd only retired about a day when, when in 2009, 
when the following week you were back doing drive time. <laughs> That's you right. Keep, I was, you I keep coming that. back. But I did go down the country then. I did six shows before I got cancer. I went down to uh, Cork and they asked me to direct some shows. Now, it was beginning to happen during the Sound of Music. I was beginning to get these pains and that yes. was my second last show. I did Sound of Music and then 2015, then 2016, Oliver. And Oliver was my last show because then they discovered that I had this tumour and I had to go in then to Vincent's and I was there for five weeks. And yes. I'm still here. But I mean, you know, when you get, you know, when you get chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it takes a lot out of you. And I was talking to other people who have had chemotherapy and it makes you really very tired. Yes. And I sleep most afternoons. Yes. You know, I usually go to bed about three o'clock and I sleep for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And I find I can't walk as far or as fast as I used to. So I still walk. Myeloma? It's, it's, yes, it's multiple myeloma. Now, it's not a curable cancer, but it's treatable. And they're still looking for a cure. Well, you're looking incredibly well. Well, thank you. People say you must that. be doing all the right things. Are you well, adhering yes, I have to things to do? I've yeah. exercises, and every month they check my bloods and they give me what's called a zometer, and that's an infusion into your arm, and that strengthens your bones. Yes. And then I have to go to a skin specialist, and I have to go to an eye specialist, and I have to go to a, a, a guy who looks after my breathing. And Professor Keane looks after all that. And now I have to go to some other fellow in Black Rock Clinic. I, I, I've seen so many doctors and professors and misters. I just don't know. But anyway. You, you, you made, uh, you, you described that uh, as a situation very, very well. But you, you also were very, um, you were brave in listening to your gut instinct on this and you kept going back to your GP who was inclined to unfortunately poo poo yes. you off a little bit on this. Yes. But you kept going back and you pressed and you were right. Isn't it yes. funny how the human body knows? Yes. I went to four different doctors and, you know, one said it's bronchitis, one said it's asthma, one said you have a chest infection. Nobody actually knew except there was one lady at the end, my own doctor was aware, there was a lady doctor, she said, you, go to, you need to go for physio. When I went to the physiotherapist, she said, you need a scan. There's something at the back of your neck. I'm really worried about this. So I went for a scan and straight away I was, I was whisked into Vincent's and the guy who looked after me in there said that they'd have to take me to St. Luke's the next day because there was no radiotherapy on a Saturday and Sunday in Vincent's. So I went up to St. Luke's in an ambulance on, on the Saturday and Sunday and that's what really saved my life because they had to do two full days of radiotherapy to try and get rid of this tumour, you know? Oh, gosh, that must have been very aggressive. Very. It was very aggressive. Yeah. Gosh. And here you are now, <laughs> pushing through. <laughs> how many years ago? <laughs> how, how, how many years ago was that? That was 2016. Yes. And so, here you are. Yeah. Still here and still doing great. I have a friend who got it eight years ago, Veronica Don's daughter, Judy. Yes. She keeps in touch with me because she has the same cancer as me. And she is now in her eighth or ninth year in remission. Gosh, oh, fantastic. I'm so glad so to hear that. Things. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. They're doing things, you know, they're, they're researching all the time. I don't know whether they'll ever get a cure for it in my lifetime, but... Anyway, as I say, I'm still here for another while. I so think. if, look, Kevin, <laughs> what, what would you say if, if you had to, if you had to talk to your younger self now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I think probably I wouldn't have pushed myself as much as I did. I, I tend to say yes to a lot of things and maybe I should have said, well, no, actually it's too much. I did push myself a lot when I was younger. Yes. You know, now, of course, I can't. And I don't want to, but um, yeah, I think I would have, I would have taken it a bit easier. But who's to know? Well, this is oh, it, Miriam. Who's to know until it happens? 
You're that's, lucky, you're unlucky, and that's it. This you're is lucky. it. Oh my goodness. Well, look, Kevin, this it's been wonderful talking to you. And, oh, and I just hope it. that so much. Thank I, you. When this whole pandemic is over, I hope that we hear you on the radio waves and on the oh, on the TV again and know. on shows. You never know where I'll turn up. Exactly. <laughs> well, and the good book, luck to you, Miriam. The book is called It's Wonderful Life. That's it, a musical, a musical life. Musical life. It's wonderful, a musical life. And it is Kevin Hawk with Alison Maxwell. And it is an absolutely wonderful read. And if you're from Dublin, if you're from Ireland, but if you're from Dublin, you'll recognize so many of the places and the people that he mentions. I've absolutely had a ball having you on the show. And I'm so yeah. glad that you agreed. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it, Mary. I, we really enjoyed it too. Have a fantastic St. Patrick's Week. And to everybody watching, I hope you Thanks. enjoyed the show. And we'll see you very, very soon.